Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this next session of the Virtual Island Summit. I know many of you are getting up nice and early if you're in the Caribbean or, or the Americas. I appreciate that. Um, we've got a really another really interesting day of speakers, and this morning um, we have speakers from Orkney in the north of Scotland. This first keynote session is with Laura Watts, who I'll introduce shortly. And um, following that, we have another session from the European Marine Energy Center based in Orkney that will be a technical session looking at Orkney's approach to renewable energy and, and the efforts being made there. Uh, while we're waiting for a few more people to join, I'm going to launch the poll that those of you who have uh, participated in other sessions will now be familiar with. Just curious to see where you're all joining from. I'm expecting that, um, We'll have a pretty strong uh, showing from Europe today, um, but also, oh, we have some people from Australasia as well. I guess there's not that many sessions that work for you time-wise, so appreciate you joining this one in, in your evening. Okay, and feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box. I can see a message from Mark Arnold. Um, unfortunately, Zoom automatically sets the messages to go to all panelists. And if you send a message to all panelists, only me and Laura can see that. So make sure you change it to all panelists and attendees. Um, so everyone here can see your messages and start, start sending some messages in. The Q&A option is separate. So if you have questions, make sure to submit them through the questions and answer box because in that way I can ensure that we don't, don't miss them. So you can see mostly people joining from Europe but are scattering from a few other regions and no surprise that Caribbean and Latin America, uh, people are still asleep there but maybe they'll be watching this on record later. Okay, next quick session, uh, poll question rather, the sector that you're joining from. So obviously this session is a bit more coming from academia, but there's a strong interest here for the private sector as well. So yeah, as expected, we've got a strong academic showing. I can see Gerard Prinson here um, from, I forget your university, Gerard. You'll have to type it in the chat. Is it University of Auckland or, um, or not? But I know you've been a strong supporter of all of our sessions. Okay, and Strong academic audience, uh, but also interest from the private sector as well. And I know a lot of people will be watching this on record afterwards. Okay, well, now we have uh, people joining in. Uh, we're going to just introduce our main speaker for today. Laura Watts is a poet, writer, ethnographer of futures and interdisciplinary senior lecturer in energy and society in the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh. As a scientist, as a science and as a science technology studies scholar, she has explored the effect of edge landscapes on how the future is imagined and made. She is the co-author of Eben and Flowen, um, forgive my Orkney dialect pronunciation of the title, the, words, the world's uh, first poetic primer for marine renewable energy. And in 2017, she won the International Cultural Innovation Prize and the Reconstrained Design Group uh, for a community built energy storage device designed from scrap. So really excited to have Laura. The focus of today will be on energy at the end of the world and Orkney Island Saga, her most recent book, which is published by MIT Press and is also one of the books available in our Island Book Giveaway. If you haven't entered that yet, um, islandinnovation.co slash giveaway. We have seven really interesting Island books from around the world and would encourage you to enter that for your chance to win one of those. So thank you to Laura and the publishers for donating a book. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Laura to get started. Thank you, Laura. Well, thanks ever so much for the introduction, James. I am incredibly excited to do this because I think that this whole event, you know, Virtual Island Summit, is a fantastic way for all of us who are both um, either living on islands or collaborating with islands to actually have a conversation together. Um, <clears throat> so thanks to everyone from around the world to, for participating in this um, event 
uh, I think that there's, there's lots to say. And really importantly, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about my research um, as a science and technology studies scholar collaborating with Orkney. Um, but as James said, there's also going to be after me a panel with uh, my collaborators and with all the fantastic people who are working at the European Marine Energy Centre and other companies in Orkney who will uh, tell you exactly how they're doing uh, technically what they're up to at the moment with their energy futures that they're making. So I think it's a really nice bookend. My talk which will connect with those of you who are uh, working around energy and island issues or interested in those and then after that you'll be able to talk directly uh, to those people who are actually really making it happen in Orkney. So I really uh, commend you to try and do kind of both of those if it's possible. <coughs> okay, so energy at what I'm calling the edge of the world. I've been exploring the energy future, a future perhaps five years, perhaps 5,000 years hence. I dream of this future as I lie on the fossilized bones of the geological past here on the ancient sedimented lake bed that was once Lake Orcady 400 million years ago. I lie on these stones in Orkney, islands of the northeast coast of Scotland, where I've been researching the energy future for the last decade. Here, head to the rippled remnants of a distant past, I can imagine a distant future and resist the apocalyptic tales of the end of the world. One of my dreams is of my fossilized bones forming Lake Orcady in some far future when new islanders will sail over the old. Dreaming on Lake Orcady is an art book project, an experiment in opening up island futures at a time when many islands, Orkney included, are on the planetary front line of climate change. As with many islands with fragile, unique ecosystems and small populations, precarity is a way of life here in Orkney, which has led to a self-determined resilience to keep making the future, to still be here. Whilst other places lament a lack of low carbon action, Orkney has spent decades just getting on with decarbonizing, moving towards electric cars, locally owned wind turbines, wave and tide energy, hydrogen fuel, and last month they announced they will trial electric aeroplanes. Now the islands generate 120% of their electricity needs from their home-blown renewable energy. The islands are not remote, but on the leading edge of the climate change future. My role as an ethnographer and academic researcher is to create a guide to these energy islands I've been privileged to collaborate with to tell some small piece of their long energy saga. Welcome to not the end, but the edge of the world. A saga in three parts. Saga one, at the edge on Lake Orcady. Looming over you is a monolith three or four times your own height. The surface is not black, but gritty with gardens of neon colored lichen. Its edges are sharp, regular. Looking up, the top is not horizontal, but a trigonometric angle so precise it appears laser cut. The stone is one of three monoliths standing on a raised dome of grass, half surrounded by the silver light of two locks. This is the stones of Stennis, a Neolithic stone circle assembled around 5,000 years ago. Between the standing stones, over low hills on the horizon, you can see the great blades of wind turbines turning like blown dandelions. In the well-farmed fields below, you see their scattered seeds, micro wind turbines, spinning beside stone farm buildings. For a moment, on the road between you and the lock, an electric car rolls past, silent as an apparition. Stone, silicon and metal technologies coexist in this working landscape. The prehistoric monument's future is entangled with the island's renewable energy future, with its turbines and grid electricity cables. Both must be done together for them to endure. A local writer and shopkeeper explained the importance of this entanglement between ancient and contemporary technology when he said to me, out of my window in Stennis, there's a bronze aged right, village unexcavated in the field. Across the road is the farm of Erland. It's got biting roots. Then on the shores to the right is an Iron Age rock. Behind was a Neolithic standing stone. So it informs the decisions you make. It's like being part 
of a long set of beads that stretches thousands of years into the past. And you're just a dot, part of it. And it influences how you think about the future. So people in Orkney have been making technology for 5,000 years, from arrowheads and stone circles to whiskey and tied energy machines. You can see all these ages, no matter where you look, stone, bronze, iron, Viking, silicon. This is a time that you can see and touch in monuments and artifacts scattered over fields on every island in the archipelago. You can experience five millennia as a continuum of human technology and habitation. As anthropologist Tim Ingold has explained, time is in the landscape. You make the world and what you know from your movement through and engagement with the place and its archaeology. And that temple record can be thousands of years or a minute old. In Orkney, as you move, you experience a world where you're just a dot on a 5,000 year old string. Orkney poet George Mackay Brown once wrote and said much more succinctly than I, the Orkney imagination is haunted by time. But this deep time does not leave the island stuck in their history. In contrast to the mythology that rural areas are slow to change, the islands are actually ahead of, more, of many urban places. They have eight large scale community owned wind turbines, over 700 local owned micro wind turbines, an electric car network, all operating on their decade old smart grid. And I've not yet told you about their world leading wave and tide energy test site, which you'll hear about later from the European Marine Energy Centre. As a local member for the Scottish Parliament points out, this means that the islands are hitting government targets well ahead of 2020 deadlines. Orkney shows what living in the energy future can be, and the point is that it can be. The islands are already there, the sustainable future is doable in all its imperfection. The UK government describes this future in its report, which says, a high carbon world is one with more extreme weather, where we and our children are faced with the costs of adapting the way we live and the infrastructure and systems that support us. We must face up to these challenges and make the necessary investment to a low carbon economy now. But this is not the future, this is the Orkney present. When the official Lifeline ferry stops sailing for a few days due to a storm, which might be regarded as extreme weather in other places, the islands are cut off, but there's no panic. Islanders, as with other islanders around the world, have long adapted to living in a world where the lights and phones go out for hours at a time, and you can't travel off the island for a day or two. Like islanders everywhere, they just reach into the chest freezer and pop round to the neighbour and check they're okay. They have faced up to it, and already meeting the challenge of adapting their energy infrastructure. They are investing in their own more resilient low carbon energy system, the electric cars, the micro wind turbines and the rest. The world the government describes is not a prediction, but it's their present. If you want to live in that low carbon future, live in Orkney. So this will not be surprising to many of you listening. Islanders around the world have always and long understood themselves as future makers. Islands are on the planetary front line of environmental change, as I said. Their long shorelines and specialized ecosystems are finely tuned sensitive places, barometers for the whole earth. They are, as Godfrey Baldacino, island study scholar said, advanced indicators or extreme reproductions of what is future elsewhere. Islands are the harbingers the pioneers, the miners canary. What happens at the island edge is often the litmus test for the urban future. As former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan put it in his discussion of small island and developing states, islands are frontline zones where many of the main problems of environment and development are unfolding. It was, as I'm sure many of you know, the Alliance, Alliance of Small Island States, 42 island nations, who led the worldwide campaign against global temperature rise. The 1.5 to stay alive mantra has been absolutely unrelenting. They know and we know that the sea dominates this planet. Large and small chunks of dirt cover only 30% of the surface. We are all islanders on this ocean earth. People in Orkney are very aware of their own frontline fragility. Some smaller islands have only 60 or so people living on them, and their depopulation could mean an end to an entire island society. It might happen in a generation. There are already haunted islands on the horizon with derelict houses, peeling red phone boxes, 
cold kettles still sitting on the stove. That future, a complicated entanglement of social and environmental issues, is one the islanders must work hard to resist. In Orkney, a sustainable future is not an armchair debate. It's an imperative, a matter of island survival. No time to dither. The future must be a sustainable present or children and grandchildren will only be able to visit home as a ruin. This is not a commitment though to an unchanging future, but to making a thriving one at best and a precarious one in which they are at least still here at worst. There is no talk of ending. In contrast to all these apocalyptic Anthropocene stories around the world, the world itself is not going to end in Orkney. They live on that long string of time, as I said earlier. Many people feel embedded in the place. They know and need it in their bones. An ecologist and singer expressed the quiet determination to remain when she said to me, this place will always have a future because some folk will never leave. They feel they have no choice about where they could live. This is their home. They could never leave. Orkney is home to a going on togetherness of humans and habitation, hills and heather, creatures and critters, infrastructure and islands, and natural cultural togetherness that understands its shared future will endure for another 5,000 years. Saga 2. Earthrise on Lake Orcady. <clears throat> on the scrubby summit of the headland, there is an abandoned flat roofed bunker, windows empty from long years of wind and rain. The dereliction expands out in misshapen concrete blocks, punched through with rusting, twisted metal cables. I peer inside the bunker and see the concrete walls are painted green with moss. Resting beside the open doorway is a slate painted with the words viewpoint. Today it speaks true and I spend some time watching a little island left for birds ruins in the fairy folk which rests in the sea below me. Somewhere amongst the buildings and broken old defences from the Second World War there are remnants of the UK's first experimental wind turbine built and installed in the 1950s. The 100 kilowatt wind turbine was installed here on Costa Head in 1951. The structure seems to have struggled in the intense Orkney wind and collapsed after operating for just a short time. I stand now on the hallowed hill where a sustainable Orkney began its saga long ago. Orkney has been chosen as the national and international laboratory for testing experimental sustainable energy for more than a half century. I count the test sites. I stand on Costa Head, the UK's first test site from the 1950s. From here, I can see Burger Hill, the site of the UK's largest experimental wind turbine in the 1980s. In the town of Kirkwall, I've seen the silver boxes that contain the UK's first national grid battery. And somewhere in those buildings too, are the smarts that manage the UK's first active network management smart grid system. Down the street to the harbour, I can find the hydrogen fuel cells converting electricity made by tide energy turbines and a community wind turbine, which must be a world first. Then off the coast, I can see the European Marine Energy Centre grid connected wave and tide energy test sites established in 2003 and another world first, which you'll hear more about in the panel after this. The list of these test sites could also include a myriad of quieter, community-led sustainable energy projects, no less significant. The hydrogen fuel intended to power the ferries, individual investments in electric cars, the Tesla Powerwall home batteries and photovoltaic panels in affordable housing projects. There's a real tension though between this extraordinary list of Orkney test sites and the failure of government and the energy industry to address a highly constrained electricity grid which is crippling the islands. When the UK National Infrastructure Commission released its Smart Power Report, which is a roadmap for the future development of the national grid, it seemed entirely ignorant of all the grid futures I talked about that are happening in Orkney. This is probably not surprising to many of you listening, and it's not uncommon from those down south. When you, when you live in Orkney, everyone's down south. As a local marine energy social scientist, Sandy Kerr spelled out to me, he said, we can move quickly in Orkney. 
But when it happens in a big metropolitan city with its money and location, you cannot compete. It's only when history is repeated where national newspapers and governments seem to have their offices that stories become fixed as the official account. It's an old problem, one I'm sensing might be very familiar to those listening. The disadvantaged and marginalized are written out of history. Their achievements do not pass into oral legend to become subsumed into colloquial fact. Previous achievements have been reasserted and their memory reinforced to be retained. Islands at the edge often share this marginal experience, overlooked as sites of technological innovation, except when they figure as sites of island novelty. The chair of the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum attempted to transform this perception when they spoke to representatives who were visiting from the UK national grid. He said to them, we are keen to show how it all works here. Orkney is a living laboratory for sustainable energy systems. We aren't there yet, but we're a lot closer than most. And we have a valuable insight into what works and what doesn't. The phrase, living laboratory, has been circulating in the islands as a brand to promote them as a living test site, with its long test site history embedded in the story. But living laboratory, a phrase which may feel familiar to some, carries within it some serious tensions. These tensions explain the apparent paradox that the islands are both a significant national energy test site and an overlooked region of renewable energy generation. A paradox which is exemplified by the energy operator, which celebrates and uses the islands as a test site for their smart grid technology, whilst also abandoning them to a limited capacity grid. When I've talked about the islands as a living laboratory to people in Orkney, there is a simultaneous agreement that this seems right, capturing the inspirational qualities in the place along with a stronger version to be seen as a lab rat. Charles Darwin called Galapagos Islands a living laboratory as evolution, coining this much used phrase. In a living laboratory, islands are understood as a model or microcosm of the wider world, isolated like a Petri dish. So living laboratory carries within it the idea of exploitation and colonization of the island territory it describes, allowing others who are not islanders to assert control over their laboratory test site. French Polynesia was treated as a test site for France's nuclear weapons up to the 1990s, for example. This island model produces an isolated place that accrues status as a site of research and testing but only through exploitation and disempowerment. The power flows in one direction. Orkney Islanders' ambivalence to being a living laboratory is very understandable, and some of you might share that ambivalence as well. So why might Orkney continue to call itself a living laboratory as they are doing? How to counter the colonial tensions that come with this label? An Orkney-based journalist suggested some answers when he wrote in the local newspaper, with a constrained electricity grid and an excess of renewable energy, Orkney is already attempting to tackle the kind of energy management challenges that the rest of Europe could have to face in the future. I read that as a, the challenge of being called a living laboratory being turned into a double advantage. So first, the constrained electricity grid in Orkney is being transformed into a future that the rest of Europe could have to face as European and probably uh, electricity networks worldwide move to renewable energy. In this way, the marginalization that Orkney experiences on the grid becomes indicative of a coming constrained electric world. As the National Infrastructure Commission says, increasing our electricity networks are moving to a system in which generation is distributed more widely across the country and is more variable in, in nature. They're talking about the move from fossil fuel to renewable power. <clears throat> Orkney, with its distributed wind turbines and electric cars, are living this future, even as those making it don't quite realise it yet. The second advantage that, that's being used in the term living laboratory is that, as I'm sure many of you, pretty much everyone agrees, 
Islands are of course not separated or isolated by the sea like a petri dish, but connected over the sea to other maritime locations, of which this conference is an excellent example. This international outlook was emphasized by the director of EMEC who explained to me, Orkney has always been at a crossroads. A good protective anchorage, good for transatlantic trade. People travel and bring back different perspectives. There's no point about being against outsiders. Half the people here are outsiders. Orkney has much in common with other island regions and coastal nations. <clears throat> the energy projects are overseas endeavors. They work in collaboration with the National Taiwan Ocean University, the Ocean Energy Association of Japan, and many others with whom they've been collaborating on marine energy testing. The Smart Island Energy Systems Consortium, which is testing microgeneration and smart metering technologies, is being led by three islands, Orkney, Madeira, and Samsu in Denmark. In these experiments, Orkney is not serving some colonial power, but connected undersea with places where they become a different kind of living laboratory. Rather than Orkney being the test site used by other places, they all become one archipelago of test sites, thinking and working together. In this, I am inspired by Elizabeth de Locri's thoughts on archipelography. Chains of islands in fluctuating relationship to their surrounding seas, islands and continents. Her fluctuating tidal relationships between islands trouble the waters between anthropologists, how offers more well-known Sea of Islands in the Pacific. But both are committed to refiguring islands in sea relations rather than in small territorial isolation. Through brine transmitted relationships, the making ebbing and flowing archipelography over the ocean earth with Madeira, Taiwan, Japan, Orkney is plugged into energy projects that do not require with limited cables. Orkney becomes a living laboratory in an ocean of living laboratories, islands and edges, each with unique expertise and learning to be shared. Saga three, future dancing on Lake Orcady. <clears throat> Electricity is often taken to be ephemeral and invisible, hard to form a relationship with, hard to care for it might seem. But electricity in stormy Orkney is easy to see and touch, easy to hold as kin. In Orkney, you can feel the energy on your body in the pervasive cold winds that blow straight from the Canadian Labrador coast or Arctic. As with other edge locations, going out for a pint of milk can require some serious force of will to remain vertical. Storms are also hard on the suspended electricity cables that hang from poles over the fields. Faults happen in the undersea power lines between the islands and in the cables strung up over the heather. The electricity might go out for a half a day, which can also take down the mobile phone network, landline phones and internet, electric heating systems and cookers. This will probably feel familiar to many of you listening. As science study scholar Susan Lee Starr long ago noted, infrastructures become visible on breakdown. The precarity of the energy infrastructure in Orkney makes it not just visible, but something you have to care for, something you can therefore farm for. So farming their energetic seascape, they are, from their wind, waves and tides. On one beach in the island, you can touch the mottle segmented surface of the national grid cable dripping with slick seaweed. I like to imagine it feels warm from too many island-made renewable energy pushing into the wires. This cable is a huge bottleneck. As I said, the islands generate 120% of their renewable energy from their place, which means all the excess has to be loaded on this grid cable and exported to the rest of the country. Due to the grid capacity problem, the operators installed the active network management system for the smart, a smart grid system, which I mentioned earlier. And these smarts in the electricity network balance generation with consumption by switching off local wind turbines when the load is too high to stop the grid cables from overloading, literally melting. It's a process called curtailment. 
This is not the simple techno fix solution it might appear to be, however. The community owned wind turbines are generating revenue for the islands and whenever their turbines are switched off, the islands lose desperately needed income. Some Orkney community wind turbines are curtailed over 40 or 0% of the time, which is a staggering loss of income to islands that struggle with the highest levels of fuel poverty in the UK. So on beaches around the archipelago, you can see what undersea interconnectors look and feel like, and that is important. Electricity is visible here, not just as potential in the stormy seascape, but in the precarious power limited cables. As undersea cable researcher Nicole Stariolsielski points out, making visible the undersea cables that connect communication, and in this case energy, infrastructures, makes their precarious structure clear. In Orkney, infrastructure breakdown is just mundane. Not cause for a social media meltdown is in other places. I talked earlier about how the islands have already adapted to infrastructure breakdown in what the UK government regards as a low carbon future. People shrug, clean out the stove, get it lit with a bag of spare coal. Many are on gas, bottle, gas bottles, oil file cookers and heaters, or run with oil tanks that don't blink when the electricity does. So when the infrastructures considered essential to modern living fail, Orkney carries on with modern life, just wearing an extra jumper. Again, something I suspect is very familiar across many island places. Although communication, energy and transport infrastructures can all but be broken in a storm, civilization carries on. Despite what dystopian science fiction writers might suggest, when the lights go out, there is no apocalypse, no zombies, no drama. Orkney is resilient. And it suggests that resilience is possible even when energy infrastructures might not be. Precarity, part of edge living the world over, is perhaps not a lack, but a guide to life lived with nuanced care and participation in our low carbon future. A second effect of the visibility of precarious infrastructure from stopped ferries to curtailed turbines is described by my fellow ethnographer of Orkney and Orkney Islander herself, Becky Ford, who says, we can be a place where things are trialed. We have more of a sense of community, a sense of the interconnectedness of things. When the boat doesn't go, you're stuck here. You're connected to the weather, to supply chains. We have Western consumerism, but it's tempered. Markets and their flows, whether electricity or internet, are tempered, as she so eloquently describes it. Electricity markets are not unfettered flows, but are tempered by the rust and metal of the national grid cable, which you can touch on the beach. Things that are assumed to flow simply and easily elsewhere in the world are shown to be tempered and fractured in Orkney and places like Orkney. New washing machines, new cars, new clothes, always require ships to reach their customers. The maritime fleets and container ships are invisible to most. This rubs up against all the myths and ideals of so-called free-flowing capitalism, like frictionless capitalism. Manuel Castell's much lauded space of flows theory is shown not to hold. Things never flow. They always have to be carried through cables and on ferries. As anthropologist Anna Singh would say, there are always frictions inherent to commodity flows. In Orkney, the friction is in the limited grid cable under your hand on that beach, in the static noise on the line during bad weather. I've been told that the broadband speed noticeably improves when for some when it rains because the conductivity on the old phone cables increases. So-called free-flowing trade is shown to be hubris in Orkney. It's an asymptotic dream that can only be tended towards and never reached. The islands cannot sell unlimited renewable energy through the grid to the world, no matter how much any market economic changes. The rust encased cable is the visible and material limits on their market, as are cables and infrastructure on every market. Those who live and work at the infrastructure edge often have a very intuitive understanding of this. The spectre of unending, unfettered economic growth never holds here. Growth is always tempered. Its infrastructural, social and technical limits are all too clear here at the precarious edge. Conclusion. A door to elsewhere 
from Lake Orcady. <clears throat> Electricity is not stopped at the wall in Orkney homes. School children draw their island with its community wind turbine, with its tide energy turbine. The islanders, their generators and their grid are entangled together. I believe that's one way in which the electricity grid has become malleable by people in Orkney. By that I mean that the grid is not governed just by the usual electricity actors, state regulators and multinationals. Instead, the entanglement between islanders and infrastructures gives people purchase on their grid. Electricity is a species of trouble, to draw on feminist scholar of science Donna Haraway. Electricity is a species that lives in the islands as much as the wildlife and livestock. The islanders can thus get at their grid, pull on the threads that constitute it and make their energy future otherwise. The islanders are farming wind, hydrogen waves, tides, are managing their grid with home batteries and car batteries. They've been farming their landscape for 5,000 years and this is just another aspect of their ongoing self-determination to still be here for another 5,000 years. National government and multinationals may imagine electricity as centralised with power radiating outwards from urban centres to distant islands, but Orkney has quietly got on with reshaping its energy system into a distributed, decentralized, locally led and low carbon energy tapestry. That such reweaving of the grid is happening here at the edge of the network should not be surprising and probably is not surprising to many of you listening. Because when I say edge, I mean it in the double sense of technological cutting edge and geographic marginal edge because that's what the extended literature on innovation shows go together. Despite the pervasive story that innovation happens through clustering and in smart cities, innovation at the edge has been documented and celebrated at length. Islands and other edge locations are places where people improvise and innovate practical ad hoc solutions to similar problems. As ethnographers Philip Benini and Jonathan Taggart have argued, an islander assembles together an island by way of making use of whatever is to hand. This saga of a small group of islanders living with and transforming their precarious grid infrastructure into one that is more enduring, more resilient, is just one case study. Living at the edge, where precarity makes visible what others cannot even imagine, is where you can experiment, and you often have to experiment. It is no romantic place to be. It is hard work. It is never ending work. But here is where I once wrote that there is a door to elsewhere on Lake Orcady. Elsewhere is possible here. Orkney, like so many similar places, shows how edges are sites of possibility, sites of experiment, sites of hope, reaching out over our ocean earth to make new energy futures together. Thank you. Oh, can you put your mic down, James? There we go. Apologies. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, we got a lot of interest in the chat. Just wanted to highlight um, that we're joined from, and apologies if I miss one, so drop it in the chat. We've got people from um, Malta, from Scilly, from first, I see Stephen Kerr from Shetland, the Cook Islands, Mauritius, uh, across Scotland, Colonsay, Jura. Um, Argyle, I'm not sure if you're on the mainland or on, on one of the islands, and some more. I actually lost my list as I started to say that, but I know there's even more there as well. So thank you all for people all over the world for um, for joining. And I know you mentioned about Orkney being an international place. We had James Stocken, from, uh, who's leader of the Orkney Islands Council, speak yesterday on the Arctic panel. And he actually mentioned within the last two weeks, they recently received the, the, Minister, of Mal the Minister of Climate Change from Malta, visited Orkney, they had a delegation from Indonesia, and I know there's been many, many more international delegations visiting as well, which is really amazing. 
Um, so please send some questions in the chat. Laura, the first question that came up is what does the t-shirt behind you say? Not sure if that's relevant. <laughs> and we don't have to dedicate too much time to that. I, I, it's actually, it's, I'll start that because it's always good to start a question. And I have to say thanks everyone for, for listening and being there. And I would want to say that please, if you've got further questions that I can't answer now, do get in contact with me, drop me an email, a message. I'm always really keen to talk with people, different island experiences, your own experiences of any fu uh, energy futures at the edge. Um, so the t-shirt says, on the earth, under the sky, beside water. And it's actually uh, done by an artist, Alistair Peebles, who's based in Orkney. And um, it's part of an installation uh, that he did around thinking through the relationship between um, archaeology and the futures and the landscape in Orkney. Uh, so yes, I encourage you to go to uh, Alistair's website, which is called Bray Editions, B-R-A-E. And it's indicative of something which goes on in Orkney a great deal, which is a kind of inseparability between arts practice and science practice, uh, of which I feel I'm very much part of that uh, whole collaboration. Fantastic. I'm glad it was relevant to, uh, to the conversation. So worth bringing up. Um, the, one of the things that has come up a lot in the chat, people are really interested in this concept of um, a living laboratory. And I know that for many islanders, that is a sensitive, uh, a sensitive topic. There, there's been a lot of history of exploitation, um, of course, in the Scottish Islands, um, particularly in the Western Isles uh, or, or the, the, the Hebrides, rather. Um, but islands around the world, as you mentioned, have been a place of exploitation. And one of the suggestions was uh, to use the word lighthouse instead, which, although could be interpreted in a similar way, has a less of an exploitative connotation. That's actually something that the International Renewable Energy Agency, they have a small island developing states energy program and they use that terminology. Um, any thoughts on that, Laura, the lighthouse or are there any other terms that you've come across that perhaps um, could yeah. change that narrative? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, well, I talked about living laboratory because um, a lot of people in Orkney have been talking about living laboratory and trying to find a way to, you know, can we resuscitate this term um, and what, and a term that has, you know, living laboratory is, highly problematic for all the reasons I said and that's the reason you said um but I wanted to kind of like talk about it because some not everyone listening will actually maybe realize some of the, 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 the you know the really appalling colonial and uh issues associated with it so I wanted to make sure we talk about it explicitly about why it's problematic um but I also wanted to also be clear about the ways in which some people in Orkia are trying to find a way can we can we leverage that if it's a term that has purchase um, for people elsewhere in the world, you know, is there a way we can, we can, you know, can that term be turned around? Can it, we can make it, reuse it for ourselves and, and take ownership of it. So that's why I wanted to put that on the table in the talk. Um, you know, I think for me, it's about provide, you know, what terms work for different people. I certainly know in Orkney, I've heard people use, talk about the idea of being a beacon um, with respect to marine energy, for example. Uh, so I think that sense of beacon lighthouse is something I also hear in Orkney. Um, you know, like all play, like all islands, it's not a case of, uh, you know, everyone using all the same terms all the while. Uh, but I think it's about recognizing that different terms speak to different kinds of audiences. Um, and that seems really important. You know, what, what terms are going to do the best work to build the collaborations that we want to build, the most healthy forms of collaboration that we want to build? Absolutely. And I think there's also an element of whether that change is being coming internally, like it is in Orkney, or whether it's been imposed from the outside. Um, but as you say, there's so many variations. One example um, that I've had a recent conversation with was about the Isles of Scilly in England. And um, there, the, the, there's been a, a really interesting movement. But the, the term lighthouse, um, as, as we saw in the chat from Jim, was, uh, sorry, the term laboratory was, was reacted against, not necessarily that positively there. Yeah, it, um, it's exactly that. It's who's using the term laboratory? And it's a very different thing if it's someone in Orkney describing themselves, thinking about connections with other so-called living labs and other locations, which is different from if it's someone externally sort of describing a living laboratory. And that's really important. The politics makes a difference. And then we also had a chat, there was some conversation in the chat about whether, who gets to call themselves an, an Orcadian. Um, people were arguing whether you need five or, or 10 generations in the, in the graveyard to count as an Orcadian. I know where I'm from, um, it's only three. So I've been here for four generations in Shropshire and, and I get to count myself as a local, but often on islands that is even, um, <laughs> that is even uh, expanded. So um, Annie, Annie uh, Tucson, sorry if I'm not, saying your name right Annie um, said the living lab discussion is interesting but, but I'm also having big issues with the conceptualization of islands as vulnerable 
especially since I've moved to Orkney, that just doesn't seem appropriate. Do you have any thoughts on this? And I, I guess as well as vulnerable, very similar concept would be resiliency as well. Resiliency can be empowering, but there've been several scholars, particularly looking at indigenous peoples in North America about how it can also be disempowering. So vulnerability and resilience, Laura? Yeah, I think all those terms are really important because again, it's about who says and what, what is the effects of um, who's saying that and what comes with that terminology. <clears throat> so, um, you know, with, this, with respect to my experience as an Orkney, I, I, on the one hand, I completely agree. There is a, you know, a, a, you know, one of the reasons I've been back and forth for 10 years and, and collaborating up there is because there's this extraordinary sense of it being a world center. And, a, and, you know, and I talk a lot, the reason I talk about the enduring quality of the islands is because they're not going away anytime soon. But I also think I wanted to make sure that, you know, you, you, the story is complicated. Then there is extraordinary high levels of fuel poverty. You know, there are islands in Orkney which are very precarious, that have small numbers of people. And it's not, and, you know, I think about the community trusts that I talk with in different islands in Orkney. And, you know, the amount of work, the sh you know, the sheer labour that goes into just figuring out how are we still going to be here? How are we going to make jobs in our islands? How are we going to get funding? How are we going to figure out how to keep our ferries? Um, you know, these are questions and that need answers that people have to work at. They can't kind of like just let it lie or... Um, you know, th these are questions that if you maybe live in a, in, in, in a city, you don't have to, you know, try and address. So I think that extra, la you know, extra labour, the extra work that so many people, not everyone, but a lot of people in islands, particularly in Orkney, put in, you know, to, you know, the Community Trust Development Trust, for example, are run by people in their spare time. You know, people are often doing unpaid labour uh, in order to kind of keep their islands going. So I, I felt that that's, that's the thing I wanted to kind of talk about that, and recognise um, the commitment that people have um, in order to do that. So I would say it's not, you know, it, it, that, that vulnerability, I think I prefer the word precarity because I think it cap, it's, it's a more useful term for me than vulnerability, is, is a way to remember that the, the, the resilience is something that has to be worked for. You can't kind of like sit, rest on your laurels in, in Orkney or places like Orkney. And that's what I think is really important. And I want to acknowledge and make visible and celebrate that work. Absolutely. And um, for anyone interested in that idea of resiliency, if you look a couple of back issues or email me and I can send it to you of Island Innovation, I wrote an article about that, which has got some great links to some academic work that has explored resiliency and kind of the, the, the ideas behind that. Um, Gerard Prinson in New Zealand, who I mentioned before, said, could you talk a bit about how um, you think here farming and sales and service employees in Orkney speak about this wider long-term perspective um, that you're painting. Sorry, I, I mean, I can talk about farming, but then there was different, did I hear in different sectors? Yeah, so I, I guess it's just the different, if there's a difference in how these different sectors look at this long-term change. And, and if I might kind of add on to that question as, as, as well. So, so, so do different, people of different backgrounds kind of see this differently. But also you talked about this idea of fuel poverty as well. And so it's one thing kind of showing off Orkney to the world about how great all of these innovations are, but to what extent do people on the ground see that? And, and how do they view it um, as opposed to kind of people looking in and talking like we are now? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to say as, you know, indicative by the fact we've probably got quite a few folk who are actually up in Orkney at the moment who, are, who live there would say that, you know, not everyone agrees uh, about, you know, renewable energy or, and, you know, what the energy future should be. Um, I think uh, when I spoke uh, to, to James Stocken a few years ago about this, he sort of said, you know, there's a sense in which, um, I'm probably going to slightly misquoting him, it's in the book, but, uh, you know, we're all in this together. But we and we're all heading to the same finishing line in Orkney, but we've got different ideas about the route to do that. What's the best route through? Um, and I think that, you know, that's something which probably feels familiar to a lot of people listening is that, of course, when you have different groups of people, not everyone's going to agree and so, uh, on what on the best way forward. And that's really important. But I think crucially, the, you know, there is, a, there is in Orkney something that's very important, which is the is the dialogue, is the discourse, is the, is the understanding that this is a really important issue to talk about. So um, the participation in the debate around, you know, what renewable energy futures do we want? You know, the debate about which wind turbines where, you know, the debate about which marine energy devices where, it, you know, people are participating in the debate, even if they might not always agree. And that for me is how you move forward. You have a discussion. And that I think is really, really crucial to make visible. You know, it's, it's not kind of like, well, 
as anyone listening will know, just because you live in a, a small community doesn't mean you magically all get on with each other, right? You have to do the, the work of figuring out how we're going to do this. And, and I think that's one of the things that I, I try and highlight is, again, that work of how do we make a decision about what we're going to do with respect to energy, energy futures. I think one thing I would say with respect to the different sectors, because that's a really nice question, um, I would, you know, broadly speaking, two of the big sectors in, in Orkney, aside from uh, renewable energy, is the farming industry and also tourism. Um, so I think that I, you know, farming, as, as many people have said, I haven't spent a lot of time talking to the farmers. I unfortunately can't talk to everyone, 22,000 people, but the farming industry is often bound up with a sense of longevity. So farmers, uh, as other people have talked about, are involved in maintaining the islands for a long period of time. Um, so there is a sense to, to looking after and being guardians of the landscape and the seascape for longer periods of time. So I think that although the specifics of what the energy futures might look like, the commitment to uh, an ongoing future, an enduring future, one that's going to be here for a long period of time, is something that I think was, is shared, certainly in my experience, across uh, different islanders that I've talked to, no matter what sector in, whether they're in tourism or whether they're in, in, in farming, although the details are always going to vary about what that should look like in practice. And I think uh, for people uh, who are less familiar with Orkney, when I first went up there, I was told that Orcadians are farmers that do a bit of fishing, whereas their neighbours to the north in Shetland are fishermen that do a big, bit of farming. And uh, that is a, Thank you. Yes, that was a quote <laughs> that came to my mind too. It's a really helpful distinction to understand land, the landscape. But, you know, Orkney, I talked about farming in my talk because it's a, it's a farming landscape and that's really important. Absolutely. And that actually surprised me the first time that I was up there that the land is actually a very fertile landscape. You know, it is windswept, it is on, on the ocean, but uh, there's a lot that grows there. And, and so the farming is very, very much viable. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a livestock location. So yeah, very important. So Christine Milne um, sent in a comment from Tasmania. Christine's actually going to be on our climate action panel um, that will be Friday morning in, in, in Australia or Thursday night. Um, if you're further further west, um, and she's a former uh, senator for for Tasmania in the Australian in the Australian Senate, she says, "Is there a temptation for um, energy energy corporations to colonise or exploit Orkney to generate energy for income with with little benefit to local people?" And I know that's something that we see in in in, in a lot of islands where this relationship can be quite exploitative. Yes, and I think it's a really important question. You know, who's generating the energy? And I mean, as many people listening will know, you know, not all wind turbines are the same. They might technically be the same object, but who owns them? Who's generating the energy? Um, you know, for whom really changes what those infrastructures are and changes your relationship with those with those uh, wind turbines. So it's a really important question. In Orkney, there's a mixture. Um, I, I, you know, there is, as I said, uh, um, I think it's seven or eight. Ask the panel afterwards, they'll know the exact number of, of large scale community wind turbines. Um, and they are, you know, as I said, they've been bought by the Community Development Trust. We've got a bank loan to pay for them. And then they're basically getting uh, the feed in tariff, uh, which then is income that goes back to the local community. There are also a number of uh, wind turbines which are um, installed by companies, um, including the, the energy operator. Uh, which are, which I believe some of them basically donate money to the local community, but they are actually owned by the energy operator. So th there is a tension there for sure. I think one of the interesting things about Orkney um, is the fact that um, as I talked about in my, you know, you heard about the stone circles um, and in fact, Orkney has an extraordinary, many of you uh, listening might have visited, it's got this extraordinary archeology. span You can't move for stone circles, Viking remains, brocks, you name it. It means it's really hard to find places where you can put up a wind turbine. <laughs> because uh, you know the landscape is extraordinarily rich uh, in archaeology. It's also very, very rich in wildlife. Has a lot of protected areas, uh, peak protected areas, areas protected for wildlife. So um, uh, it's not necessarily. It's not a place where the landscape suits. Um, you know, putting up kind of like you know twenty or thirty large scale wind turbines because there's just nowhere to put them. So the, there's a relationship between the, the what's possible for the wind for wind turbines who gets to own the wind turbines and the archipelago landscape so um although for sure it's complicated it's mixed in orkney uh you know that's something that's uh, that people feel very uh, very hot on in terms of who owns those wind turbines where does the energy go um, and that's something that's really crucial to to remember 
Yeah, and I saw that uh, Becky May, who um, is from Orkney, although I noticed she said she doesn't describe herself as an Orcadian because her family have only been there since 1981, but she is from Orkney and, and joining in from Orkney now. Um, she says that she's interested in the idea of developing technologies where energy generation can be, connect, uh, can be kept local. Um, that, and she thinks this is key when we think about shopping local, reducing environmental impact to freighting goods, and surely this applies to energy as well. Just wanted to add, I think that the UK is a particularly sensitive country in general to wind turbines. I know wind turbines are, contribu uh, are controversial around the world. Um, from my perspective, I'm not from an island, but I'm from a very small rural community. We had a we had a, a wind farm company come in and wanting to to build it here, and and locals reacted very strongly to that. And um, it's easy to cast people as as luddites or kind of not wanting to do their bit for the environment. But when a big corporation is coming in and going to make millions of dollars, um, and locals see that that they're not benefiting at all, you understand why there might be some type of reaction there. So I think. Um, that issue of local ownership is key. Don't know if you have any, any anything else to add in terms of Becky's comment. Um, well, and two things I'd say, you know, we we can't, we, many of us know that when you um, have an extractive approach to things, i.e. large company organization comes to an area and extracts energy from the landscape, whether it's mining or whether it's wind energy, this tends not to end well. Right. <laughs> you know, the, the extractive logics are, are, you know, just, you know, we, we know, it's a kind of, for me, it's a bit of a no brainer in, in, in this day and age. It's, it's, it's uh, figuring out your relationship to, uh, to people on the ground and the, the self-determination of people is really important. Um, so, you know, one thing that I've, I've constantly been talking about is, is about self-determination and, you know, people figuring out for themselves, what is it that they want to generate? And that kind of ties, I think, to, to Becky's comments as well is, is you know, what did people deciding, what, what do we want to generate? What can we generate? What's possible? Uh, for us, what's right for our landscape, because, you know, people tend to know their landscape better than most. They tend to know, you know, you know how it works, what's likely to work, what the gotchas are going to be. There's expertise that people have who live in a landscape to draw upon. Um, so I think that, you know, mobilizing that's really important. It's never, you know, it's never a kind of like one solution for everything. But I, I think that's a really crucial thing to, to remember, to draw upon that, that local expertise um, is really crucial. And to be, to, you know, we know, uh, you know, governments around the world are really thinking hard about what electricity grids have got to look like. And we're moving away from a notion of national grids to things which are much more about local energy systems. And that's the way everything's going at the moment, as, as Becky points out. Yeah, and I think also that um, just because it's green, we have to make sure that that doesn't mean it's not extractive, right? Another example that comes to mind is the Sami people, an indigenous group in northern Scandinavia. And there have been these huge battles between the indigenous groups and the national governments that want to put big wind farms up there and um, that's not because those people don't care about the environment they're often way more collected to the environment than than many others are and they live off the land but you know the the the, the impact of renewable energy is still still important and i'm saying that as someone who who works in renewable energy by the way um so one last question we just got a couple of minutes left to wrap up um or well, not really a question but a comment that i wanted to read kirsten gao in Jura, she says that in Jura's case, um, she feels that the community is strong because they have basic, um, they have to collectively fight for the same basic infrastructure and folk recognize the personal investment that people make. That strong community encourages folk to recognize that they can offer, uh, what they can offer and where they can help. In one way, a small island is the easiest place in the world to become an activist. And I wanted to add that Jura is very different. Obviously, Jura is a single island. Orkney is an archipelago with 20 odd inhabited islands. But um, the Argyll, um, I think Jura is Argyll, but a lot of the Inner Hebrides don't have the same benefit that Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles have. Those three island groups each have their own council and so can make a lot of decisions within the archipelago at least even if they have outer islands within those groups but um, some of the inner hebrides they actually have a lot of the decisions made on the council level on places inland and that has an has an impact so i don't know if you have any comments on uh, on kirsten's uh, point or anything quick as well about the impact of the the, the council on orkney um, just to say, go Jura. <laughs> you know, absolutely. You know that that the understanding of what it takes to be in a community, and then the hard work and the the, the the care. I mean, it's about care. People, you know, the care for other people, the care for the landscape. And I think that, that the comment, you know, is, is absolutely perfect. That is 
that's what I feel will resonate with many people listening. And in a way, I feel like in a strange way, doing the talk on this particular, you know, to this particular group of people, virtual lions, I'm sort of preaching to the converted, you know, people understand <laughs> what it takes. And that's a great, you know, a, gr a great joy. With respect to, you know, um, Orkney Islands Council, I think, and, and you know, Shetlands Island Council, other, other councils, I think that ability, you know, it's really important to have representation of people who understand the kind of local issues. It's not straightforward. Um, you know, people, anyone who's kind of like got a local council will know you spend an awful lot of time kind of going, oh, you know, with frustrations, it's no, you know, but I think, you know, local representation, the understanding of those local issues is something that absolutely is really crucial. Um, and I think that's, you know, uh, shared across many islands who have their own forms of government representation, which is something I think is re really, really important. And part, you know, and that's, that's that understanding that what it allows knowledge to be shared. I mean, you, you, you know, we heard from uh, James Stock and also Inga Burton from High earlier, um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise in a, a panel earlier, you know, they, they're talking about how you can therefore collaborate across different island groups. And in a way, I'd say that my, the f final thing I'm trying to talk about is the way in which, you know, I'm talking about Orkney because that's where I've been working, who I've been incredibly lucky to collaborate with, but it's about reaching out over the sea to all the islands. I mean, you know, you know, places whether it's Jura or Tasmania or you know other islands around the world this shared sense of what what do we know what can we share together what expertise do we have what can we learn from each other and that's why I feel that it's really that's the thing that's kind of going on um, and that's really important to, to keep doing to kind of share that learning um, you know around the world yeah absolutely and uh uh, we'll, we'll leave it there, but Kirsten agrees. She says it's challenging being a mixed geography council. Rachel added that Argyle and Butte Council has 23 inhabited islands, each with their own strengths and challenges, including Jura. Um, but uh, we'll leave it there uh, because in just 30 minutes, we have another panel um, coming from the European Marine Energy Center, which is based in Orkney. So if you're up for an Orkney marathon, I'd encourage you to join that, but also both Laura's and um, the next panel will be available um, on, on, on recording as well on our Island Innovation Facebook page and also directly accessible through the website. So just to, just to say with this, but I really encourage people to attend the next panel because you basically hear kind of from the horse's mouth, from the people who are actually making this stuff happen. Um, I'll know I'll be there listening on the panel. And I think, you know, it's, it's really important to actually hear from the island, you know, from folk in Orkney and what they're actually doing. Fantastic. And don't forget as well to enter the giveaway to uh, get a chance to win Laura's book, but also uh, encourage you to go out to the website and buy a copy. It's a really fantastic read and gives a very different perspective on, on Orkney. So we'll leave it there. Thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, and thank you, Laura, for this fantastic presentation. It was my Bye. pleasure. And thanks so much for everyone being there. Like I said, do feel free to get in touch. It's been, you know, I think it's a really important event pulling us all together. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Bye.